you know, empowering the mind, body, and soul of champions. It's really trying to provide a holistic program. If you want to be the best athlete, it's not good enough for you just to be the most skilled athlete. You also got to be one of the most physically strong and endurance athletes, but you also got to be one of the most intelligent volleyball players, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, you got to be rooted and grounded, you know, like mentally you got to be, you know, your identity, you have you know confidence, you have to be well-rounded and you have to be, or at least pursuing excellence in every area if you truly want to reach excellence. Where we need to know about playing and coaching beach volleyball and in some instances, indoor volleyball, which today we'll have an interesting conversation from a director who is doing both and has played and competed at a high level in both. For us, you're always welcome to visit our website, betteratbeach.com, where we have a number of ways for you to get better. We have online training programs for every skill where we can take you step-by-step through tutorials and drills so you can fix your passing, fix your setting, your arm swing mechanics, attacking and defense. And if you've ever asked yourself, am I really doing this right? We invite you to jump into one of our skill-specific courses where we help players erase bad habits, get more control of the game, and learn high-level strategy and flat-out win more matches. Our most popular online program is our 60-day max vertical jump program, and it's guaranteed to add inches to your vertical leap. If you want to add mobility, strength, speed, and power to your game, we have the answer. And we also provide online coaching and mentorship from real professional athletes and coaches. So it's perfect for people who want a coach to take them to the next level. Of course, we always run camps and clinics. So if you ever want to join us for a trip or training vacation, or you want us to come to your home city, just reach out. Email support at betteratbeach.com. Today on the podcast, I'm actually really excited because it's always fun when you get to bring a friend on the podcast and somebody who, even though you're not with them all the time, you know that they're out in the world and they have, you have like parallel paths, you know, where you're both attacking similar goals and reaching people and helping people. So every, I don't know, four or five, six months or so, I, I get a little update from our guest today and I kind of see what he's up to and it, and it excites me. It inspires me. It motivates me because he's doing things that I want to do. And then sometimes I'm doing some things that he wants to do. And we always kind of pick at each other's brains. And I, I'm really excited to have him tell all of you what he's doing and how he's built a really successful community. So I want to introduce a little bit of him and, and everything that he is doing. He is the club director for Empowered Beach Juniors. Empowered Beach Juniors is the area's premier beach volleyball club. It's located at the Empowered Sports Club on Lima Road. And they have the area's only indoor sand courts where you can play sand all year round, no matter the weather. He started in 2010 and it was the first beach club in Indiana history to have an athlete recruited and receive a scholarship to play collegiate beach volleyball. Our guest today, Will Robbins, is also the area's only professional beach volleyball player to ever qualify for the country's top two professional beach volleyball tours, the AVP and the NVL. He played college at IPFW and then suffered what was believed to be a career-ending knee injury, but he made a monster comeback in 2006. By 2010, after an eight-year sabbatical from competition, countless hours in the gym and refocusing his life, he accepted his first professional indoor contract and was on his way to fulfilling his dream. Along with competing professionally, William and his wife built a 68,000-square-foot multi-sport facility empowered sports club and the Empowered Volleyball community, and we're going to learn all about that today. So, Will, man, this is going to be a good talk. Welcome to the show. (laughs) Thanks, Mark. I appreciate the introduction. Always good to see you and talk to you. Yeah, man. So, what did I know you're traveling. Just Hey, just give me one second. I want to know what you did today. You're on the road. You're busy. You're running around. You're going uh, to other countries, and you've (laughs) got your own clubs going. So, what would you do today, man? Oh, geez. Well, I just finished USA Indoor Nationals yesterday, and yeah, I was blessed. My 17s and my 16s, you know, didn't didn't start off the season great and actually ended up going to Nationals in the Patriot Division, but both of them really, you know, caught fire when it mattered and actually made it all the way to the National Championship game. And 
My 16s, unfortunately, were lost in three. My 17s ended up winning in three. So it was amazing to be on center courts, literally across from each other, playing at the same times, hearing my teams being announced, obviously getting to coach one of them, but being able to look across to the other one and finished up with that whirlwind yesterday, drove home and then was up this morning and uh, packing up to head to Canada. And so uh, I'm currently in Windsor, Ontario, just came up for a, uh, a Can-Am invite event that we put together. I really got to meet some of the Canadian Beach Junior National Team coaches when I was in Thailand in December, mm-hmm. coaching our U21 uh, boys beach teams, and uh, really just hit it off. They really are cut from the same cloth that you and I are and just really care about the kids and the development. And they've got On Point Beach Volleyball up here. They've got five different sites. Darren O'Neill is is the club director and founder and you know just talking with him you know sharing stories like you and i do about the club world about development the good the bad the ugly you know and how we can try to you know just better you know our sport and you know after talking we decided that we're going to do a little collaborative event uh he brought a few kids down uh for a little tournament we did a little over a month or two ago and then we just came up but due to some of the vaccine requirements and a few other things going on with indoor nationals we actually were only able to bring up one team this year but it was a new event it's going to be great they've got a bunch of canadian teams so we're going to be doing some training sessions and then get to actually go and do some competition and they're going to be able to compete and we got some fun stuff to do to um, you know kind of bring some of our girls together and their girls so just a cool collaboration we're trying to do with some of the uh, the beach national team coaches from up here in Canada and, you know, just trying to build some relationships. You know, they're three hours away right across yeah. from Detroit. So they're really close to actually Fort Wayne. And so, yeah, I'm in Canada for the first time and uh, we're about to do a little three day camp and clinic and yeah, play some volleyball. So I, I think I want to ask kind of the obvious question, I guess, maybe from the director or like ju- juniors coaches side, you know, I think there are a lot of directors and clubs developing in, in little silos in, in places where they do have to travel to go somewhere else. But then you also have that choice, you know, the option of saying, well, no, we're going to compete against ourselves, right? Like uh, we're going to train against ourselves and then we'll wait to compete at tournaments. So why are you making a choice to kind of uh, host a dual training and competition meet as opposed to staying at home and training just against your guys and girls? Well, I feel like, you know, kind of like you, I'm I'm a student of the game. I'm always trying to learn. I'm always trying to learn new techniques, new verbal cues, just different Mm -hmm. ways to be able to teach the game and help it to be able to stick with our young athletes. So, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for, Uh, You know, just, you know, how everybody runs their programs, how do they coach, how do they, you know, run their clubs, how do they they coach their teams, their philosophies, offensive, defensive systems. Uh, So I'm always just trying to learn myself. And, you know, I I then kind of looked at the next stage of that is, is, you know, obviously the more I've learned over the years, obviously the better player I became and then the better coach I've become. You know, and I really want to instill that mindset into our athletes that, you know, we want to continue to learn as much as we can as players. So we're not just good physical athletes. We want to also be the most intelligent athletes on the court. And so, as you know, once you get to a certain level, everybody is pretty, for the most part, physically gifted and around the same. And obviously there's some freaks out there, but for the most part, everyone is pretty close to the same. And then it really comes down to just your intelligence, how quickly you can process information and, uh, you know, make the right choice and really just your heart, your fight, your work ethic, those things. And so, you know, I just really want, you know, my athletes to be well-rounded and be able to have different opportunities to learn from different people, to be able to compete against, you know, people outside of our area, our region, as you know, each, each region of the country, while we may all play the same sport, each region tends to have some different kind of focuses, you know, some yeah. variances in the way they play the game or the, what they emphasize. And so, you know, it's just like we're a fundamental team on the indoor side where, you know, we're running a lot of the routine plays and fast offenses and it's a lot of explosive big swings. Well, then all of a sudden you play against some teams that are all tipping and rolling and they're into a the little more crafty. You know, all of a sudden, if you don't practice that in your gym all the time, 
you know, all of a sudden it really throws you for a loop and it takes you maybe a set, uh, set and a half to really, you know, adjust to the way a team is playing. And so, you know, I really want my athletes to be able to play a lot of different, um, you know, styles of beach, indoor. I just feel that it makes them just more well-rounded and ultimately prepares them for the highest levels of indoor or beach. So, yeah, I just want my kids to have a variety of coaching, but also a variety of competition so they can really round out just their education and development. Are you going to be giving your kids over for some trainings or clinics to mm -hmm. the other coaches and saying like, hey, they've got your court now, so go and learn from them. Yeah, we're actually splitting it apart. Like I'll be doing a session on attacking. As you know, that was kind of my specialty. So I'll be doing the portion on attacking um, and then all of their coaching uh, coaches will be doing different portions um, on you know passing defense and whatnot. So yeah, our athletes will be learning from them and they'll be leading the training sessions. And then I'll vice versa be leading the training session on attacking and training their athletes as well. What would you say to somebody who's like would attack that and say, well, one coach has got their athletes on a course, you know, steering the course. And don't you think that putting them in front of another coach or, or seeing it that way might steer them off the course that you had them on or, you know, redirect them in a negative way? Are you worried about that at all? You know, there is always that chance, you know, that somebody may teach them something different, may derail them from the process or, you know, as you're trying to develop them. But, you know, I, I am selective on who I do work with. <laughs> you know, I don't yeah, just yeah. work with just anybody. And so I, I am a little protective of our athletes and I want to make sure that, you know, we don't have to agree on everything, mm -hmm. but fundamentally, we've got to be pretty close to being on the same page. But then, as you know, from the basic foundation, then there's a lot of different kind of layers to the game. There's a lot of different ways, you know, the old saying to skin a cat type of thing. So I would rather my athletes hear three or four different ways to attack the same problem. And then I can talk them through, you know, kind of why I prefer this one. I prefer this technique over this technique and, you know, feel that I have more ball control with the tomahawk versus, you know, the, you know, the different techniques you want to play a ball overhead, you know? And so right. just talking through then the different variations. And sometimes, as you know, like depending on the situation, this variation might be the best, you know, in this scenario, mm -hmm. this is the best, but I feel like sometimes too many people in our, in our sports world, you know, they think it's my way or the highway. Either you teach it my way and this is the only way to do it. And, you know, these people aren't teaching the game correctly, where I feel like we're all usually a lot closer aligned than what we think. And sometimes what we're teaching, if we sit down and talk, what you're saying and what I'm saying isn't necessarily wrong, but it's maybe, you know, we're talking about different scenarios, different situations, different levels, you know, high school versus college versus international you know, and what you do internationally, you know, these kids aren't ready for it 12 years old. And so, you know, where they are in the progression, this is, you know, they need to be learning the fundamentals, um, you know, and so passing, you know, I like center line, but I understand as you go up, center line is tough. Someone serves you high in the chest. So you got to get it off, you know, your center line and mm. you know, other people are big, you know, of passing off the hip, you know, and that's a big debate center line or, you know, outside the body or off the hip. You know, and so, you know, to me, you know, you got to teach all variations. As you know, you got to pass balls everywhere from shoulder, you know, really from <laughs> shoulder to shoulder, you know, and then teach everything above it, you know. So it's it, to me, it's all in, in different scenarios. But from the fundamentals, I want my kids to learn how to move their feet to the ball. So I want to teach them center line because too many times I feel like if you teach off the hip, and you know, and off center line, a lot of times kids end up being lazy and they don't move their feet. I they just start swinging that outside their body. Caution. I'm always like, listen, hey, the first thing you have to learn is how to get your feet to the right position. So like right. your feet have to be active. So don't just let it get outside. But once you have that ability, the physical ability to actually move where you want to move, right. then we can start teaching some of the other stuff. Um, but I think that, that uh, passing and setting come from the feet. I guess the whole sport comes with feet, really. I mean, we, right. we were having that discussion this weekend at the AVP. But, yeah, having those fast feet for passers, I think it's just – it's everything. Right. Do you teach 
passing indoor and beach differently or the same? As far as obviously location, we teach mm-hmm. different location. You know, obviously we're trying to pass a little more straight off the inside leg to just a little more in the middle, obviously off the net as opposed to indoor high and tight so they could jump set. But as far as his feet, you know, not necessarily. I am, I mean, there's a big thing in our area about, you know, indoor always right foot forward. You should always have your right foot forward with passing. What? You know, what? yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. You've got a lot of different little things. It To me, it's, What's the I like on, I had a coach try to explain it to me. Something about if your right leg is forward, the ball coming across, it didn't even make sense. So <laughs> to me, huh. I've always, just like with beach, I want my outside leg forward. So my kind of my hips are around and I'm always playing balls into the court. So I tell my athletes, honestly, to me, I like it. It's really what you prefer if somebody likes right leg forward all the time. But to me, I look at where the server is coming from. And that's going to sometimes adjust if I'm doing indoor and we're passing three. I mean, on the beach, you're passing two. I'm always my outside leg forward. So no matter when I'm passing, I like to be able to have my hips, everything finish into the court. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, Yeah, that's interesting. There's like some things that I remember from indoor and like camps, like kind of the step hop to pass like always do a step hop before you pass and i was like a lot of the things i was like always and then i always go back to okay fine give me that information let me look at it and Mm. then all i do is i try i'll go to video i'll go to the world tour and i'll go to ncaa championships and i'll look at all that film and i'll say all right let's watch everybody disprove me Mm. you know i hate watching video and saying let me prove myself right i like I, i try to take the mental side of let me look at this video trying to prove this right and then seeing how many times an elite player does or doesn't do exactly that feedback and if i don't see the best players in the world doing it on a consistent Mm -hmm. basis you know there's always the anomalies like you know phil with his goofy foot and and april's kind of a weird (laughs) people always want to use that too like oh but look he's goofy footed Uh, yeah if you were his height and his athleticism (laughs) you could be goofy footed too yeah yeah, yeah, you look at like the broad spectrum and then that's where I get my answers. And then, you know, I'll, I'll talk to you guys like you. I'll talk to, you know, Dodd and Alzina and all the, the beach coaches for, for USA. I'm like, what do you think about this? When would it work? When wouldn't it work? But there's a lot of stuff that gets made up right. or I think, especially in, like in the refing side for beach, oversimplified so that mm-hmm. like somebody tries to help explain a rule to somebody who is new to the game and so they simplify it for it and then that rule just becomes something crazy like the no hands together thing (laughs) that we're still battling or you can't set (laughs) over the net and you know i'm at like pottstown rumble i was playing in the pro division you know and i set shane i wasn't facing the net i accidentally overset him it was obvious that i was trying to set him and i'm sitting there explaining volleyball rules that that is allowed you know, right. to guys who have been playing at the open level for 10 years. I'm like, how is this still yeah. a, dis- a discussion? The hands together thing is the big thing. No, no, no. Your hands got to be touching. Your hands have to be together. <laughs> it's like, no, no, that is not the rule. It, is there fingertip action, you know, mm-hmm. on that? Yeah. yeah. So that is, but I, honestly, I think that's one of the issues with our sport is, you know, they change the rules so much. And, you know, and especially on the indoor side, you know, it goes international, they change it, and then it goes to college, and then it trickles down sometimes to high school, sometimes not, and sometimes middle school. And so you have a lot of variations. And I think that transitions over into, you know, beach, grass, any of these open level, professional level, like, what rules are we going by? You know, we're going to try these yeah. new rules, you know, the net's a net. Now it's not a net. It's just the top of the tape. Now it's the whole net again. And like, so a lot of that is because they keep changing the rules. I feel like more than any other sport, you know, not only can the spectators not follow You think they change it more than other sports? I I feel like maybe rules change all the time, right? Like (laughs) NFL, NBA, like they're constantly tweaking little rules. And I think we're just so in it that we're like, well, another rule change. But if you were so into basketball, you know, you would see like all the rules change with the time clock and and everything like that. In football, like, uh, you know, they change the the extra point distance. So every sport kind of getting changed. We're just obsessed with it, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah. We just pay attention to every little one that they change. But I feel like it does cause confusion because 
I don't know about other sports, but I feel like because we don't have all of our affiliated or associations, you know, USA is doing some stuff a little different than AAU and, you know, mm -hmm. each tour is doing something, maybe some different rules, each open level tournament, you know, kind of has some of their own different rules. Every high school league, every <laughs> high school league plays like you can toss a serve and let it fall or no, you can't like, it's, yeah. Right. So I think it's hard sometimes for, the, I mean, I've had professional athletes. I had some national team guys, you know, come in and coach and like, you know, trying to do club, trying to do high school. Like, what rules are we going by? You know, like, you know, in club, you fill out the lineup sheet different than you fill it out in high school, you know? Okay. And like, so it's like, I mean, I had guys like lost and I'm like, this dude played on a national team. Like, and he's, you know, trying to figure out what rules are going by and like arguing with a high school ref. And it's like, uh, yeah, you can't pursue in high school. There's no pursuit. And there's, <laughs> you know, like different stuff where you just don't know what rules sometimes, uh, yeah. you know, that, that organization is going by. So it does cause some confusion. Hey, give me your number one pet peeve that people teach or that you've seen teach on a big enough basis that you're just like, this is, you know, aside from being like nice and political and saying like, and yeah, but we'll teach our athletes the other way. Like, what do you hate that somebody teaches one from indoor and one from beach? Oh, geez. I guess my pet peeve for younger athletes on the indoor side is I hate, we call it middle school volleyball. The people who don't teach the game who are so focused on just winning that they teach the one ball over, you know, just send it over, mm. send it over at the lower level. And you see it even lower level beach tournaments with, you know, younger kids where just keep sending it over on one and eventually the other team's bad enough, they'll make a mistake, you know, instead of trying to teach them to pass, set the ball, try to get a swing, try to use all three hits. Um, but we have, unfortunately, a lot of, you know, young uh, coaches that are trying to make a name for themselves sometimes mm -hmm. in like that middle school world that instead of, you know, really teaching these kids the fundamentals when they're starting out, they're just trying to win and make a name for themselves. So they're not teaching them the fundamentals and not teaching them how to play the game so they can be successful at the next level. They're just teaching them little cheap kind of, you know, just keep sending it over, shoveling it to the corner and just to try to win which, as you know, there's a lot of little shortcuts you can do in the game that win when you're young, that'll never win when you're old, you know. And right. so for us, our big thing with the club is I don't mind losing at the younger ages. You know, I would rather lose early because we're trying to teach them the right way and we're trying to teach them the skills that they're going to need to be successful at the next level. And, you know, we'll sacrifice a few wins early on. And those clubs who you see winning national championships at 12, 13, 14 that, you know, you don't hear about a lot of times at 16s through 18s. Are there those, those clubs? Kind of, oh, jeez, they're everywhere. Really? Um, I, yeah, especially on so the they're, So they're side. good at coaching juniors, but they're not good at getting people into college and, and pro level or anything like that. Yeah, no, for oh. sure. I mean, we have some teams. Yeah, it's, it's all across the country, but you have teams. We're chasing national championships, flying all over the – the country, you know, 12 years old, 13 years old, like driving these kids and just focusing on winning now. And these kids are getting burned out, overuse injuries, you know, and in the end, they kind of stagnate. So I think Kobe said it best. If you're always just focused on winning, you're always typically just going to play to your strength and you're not going to develop your whole game. But if you're focused on development, then you're always working on your weaknesses. Sometimes even when you're playing matches, hey, we're going to try some new things. We're going to try some stuff we've been working on in practice. You know, indoor, you're trying to run a faster offense. You know, we're trying to run one balls. We're not just doing two balls because that's easy. No, I need you to find the timing and the tempo of a one ball, you know. So we're going to try to do a faster offense I'm at a pretty young age. But, yeah, trying to teach them these things that they may struggle with because they're a little more complicated. But if you teach them at a young age and you then give them the time to develop and give them the opportunity to fail at it, you know, then these kids continue to grow, develop. And, you know, teams that are beating us at 14, you know, we end up crushing at 16 to 18. And then, you know, I got 24 kids just in my 2022 class going on to play in college, you know, where other clubs, you know, yeah, great. You won a lot when you're young, but you got – two kids going to college, you know, five kids right. going to college. Most of them are done and, you know, over playing volleyball or burnout or just never develop the rest of their game 
you know, they were kind of one dimensional. It's um, tough because I don't think people, you know, coaches, new coaches, young coaches, and definitely, I don't think there are enough great club directors. I think like anybody like business owners, you know, you get overwhelmed with something and then it doesn't become your dream vision of it. It becomes you trying to keep up with the growth of it or with the demands of right. parents and players. And I had a U15 team that I was doing something similar to you said, I was like, listen, we're going to play this, this defense where we had one blocker. We put up one girl in the middle because my other girls were like four ten <laughs> on the wings. And I go, yeah. We're going to start every practice with block footwork. We're going to do swing block footwork. We're going to do it every day. And and I'm going to like have you do it. But I'm telling you right now, we're not going to do it in the game. But you need this skill next year, the year after that, the year after that. I mm -hmm. So we're going to drive in these motor patterns right now. Right. Even though on Saturday, hey, after you know three practices this week, on Saturday, we're not going to use it. But you need to be able to be ready for the next level. Right. Yeah, you know, and that's the same, you know, with positions. And that'd probably be, you know, kind of my other pet peeve. And that's beach and indoor is, you know, when you make a kid one dimensional, when, you know, you start them at a young age and you lock them into just one position. And it's beach is a lot different because you got to be an all around player, but you can still get locked into a I'm just a blocker. Well, it's great. You know, when you're young at 14, you're 510, you know, OK, that's a decent sized blocker you know, for a girl. But now if you don't grow anymore, I hate to break it to you. You're not blocking at 510, you know, on tour. And so it's time, you know, you need to transition to a defender. But a lot of these kids, they've just been pigeonholed into, you know, kind of this is my position. These are the skill sets I've developed. And as you know, it's really bad on the indoor side is this kid gets stuck in the middle Really All she bad. knows how to do is block so and bad. hit. Yeah, and she tops out at, once again, 5'10". She's not going to play middle in college at 5'10", unless she just yeah. jumps out of the gym. Well, guess what? That kid now doesn't know how to pass, never served. You know, guess what? She can't transition now. It's too late at 17 to a pin mm -hmm. and learn how to pass all of a sudden. So guess what? That kid washes out and, you know, and doesn't end up playing in college and fulfilling her dream because she got kind of stuck playing middle because that's what that team needed to win right now. And, you know, they don't focus on the overall development of the athlete. They just focus on what can you do to win me a little national championship or this tournament right now. And sometimes, you know, I see these clubs just sacrificing kids' careers in an effort to promote their own coaching careers or their clubs when and I get there's that fine balance because it is a business. So, you know, you want to win some, you want to go in and have some of those prestigious awards, you know, of winning a national championship and some different And that things. provides motivation, right? As well. There's a sense of pride that comes along with that and motivation. Right. So it can't just like just be about learning and everybody always loses. Right. It, then nobody yes. believes in the actual learning process. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. If you're never winning, yeah, it is your training that great <laughs> if you're always <laughs> losing. Like, so it is a balance. But to me, I truly believe if you really focus on the development and the education, then winning should be a byproduct of that. You know, mm -hmm. if what you're teaching is good and you're actually developing the athletes, then eventually there should be a point where they're far enough along in the progression that they will start to have that success. And obviously, you know, you knew me as a player. I'm, I'm as competitive as anybody. So I want to win just as bad as anybody. So we always try to balance that, that development versus, you know, the, you know, as you get, you know, the process versus outcome type stuff. Yeah. And just try to find the balance where too many times I think people swing the pendulum too far towards just the outcome and just, you know, winning at all costs. And, you know, even if you lie, cheat or steal, or if you're not cheating, you're not trying type of thing. And, <laughs> You know, and there's still the old old school coaches, the Bobby Knight style, you know, you got to be angry and you want to kill your opponent, you know, you want to, you know, and then you wonder why these little kids are just poor sports and they're terrible and they're, you know, mm. yeah, you might win a couple extra games by making this kid a, a nasty little pit bull, but in the end, now they're a terrible human being, you know, nobody <laughs> wants to play with them. They're a terrible teammate. Like they're just nasty, bad attitude, you know? And yeah. so I, I also think about long-term too, you know, yeah, I want them to have the best volleyball career, go on and play in college, hopefully the pros, but what are they going to be the next 50 years of their life? Are they going to be a good human being and a productive member of our society or the same, 
nasty cheating mentality that you taught them on the court, do they now take it to the business world and into their relationships and, you know, yeah. what kind of person are they now off the court? So that'd be my thing is just, you know, helping these kids reach their full potential and really making sure we focus on them and their development, even if it means sacrificing our egos at times and even, you know, our name and, you know, reputation of, you know, what's more important, us winning another championship or us sending another 10 kids to college. Mm. You know, as you know, we don't need any more medals. We've got enough medals and trophies. I'm sure you've got a closet full somewhere collecting dust. You've probably thrown them away because they're fun for a while and I'm excited. But after that, you know, it's a faded memory. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I used yeah. to have them like the all the player badges hung up somewhere, and I'm just like, I have no idea where they are. <laughs> it's like, I would still want to go to the tournament and hang out with everybody, and it and it's great still being able to play at the level. But it's just like, all right, like great. Right. If I if I had one player badge though, that thing would be, you know, it would be hanging up somewhere. <laughs> but at, at a certain right. point, it's just like, okay, you know, next is I guess a gold medal might hang somewhere. But even you know, I went to Ryan Millar's house, you know, and right. uh, he. He had to like dig through to find his, his gold medal a little bit. You know, it was just like, he forgot where it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and I, yeah, and you know, it's a different Olympia. I mean, I know guys that are just passing it around. You know, a couple guys have lost them, you know, because they're just letting people wear them and hang out with them. So, yeah, to be, yeah, there, there's something to be enjoyed and everything. Yeah. But I, as long as you don't sacrifice the development and everything else in an effort to try to win that. As you know, I mean, a lot of athletes sacrifice everything, sacrifice relationships, their lives, and they don't have that work-life balance, you know, and in the end, just like anything in life, you know, too much work can hurt your personal relationships, you know, too much focus on just the game, you could sacrifice a lot. I mean, it is a balance because you got to be committed and almost obsessed to be the best player you can be. But for your own mental health and everything else, you also have to have some balance and relationships and you know, and have some extracurricular activities you do outside of the sport. Do you um, think that like the crazy elite champions, like the the gold medalists, the, the Michael Phelps, the you know people who have done it at the extreme high level, are do they have a work life balance? You know, did, did, did Michael Jordan, Kobe, LeBron, Tiger Woods, Michael Phelps, are these work life balance or were they completely and one hundred percent obsessed? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I think they probably went through phases and maybe seasons where I think you've seen in each of their lives where they've probably been a little too obsessed and you saw what happened in their personal lives <laughs> with marriages and a lot of other things. So I think, you know, I'm sure they were, you have to be obsessed to a certain point to be able to really get your body to its absolute peak to really be able to perform at that level. So it does, as you know, it takes hours and hours every day of not just physical training, but the mental side and video and, and everything else. So, yeah, it is. I don't know. I, I'm not in Jordan. You know, I wasn't in Jordan in the, them shoes. I would have to say they were probably always borderline obsessed and probably crossed the line at times. And it started to affect their relationships and other areas and probably had to reassess like a lot of us athletes do. And I'm sure yeah. you do as a business owner now. Like there's times where I find myself working 120 hours a week. You know, and like work until 4 a.m. And it's like, oh, shoot, you know, I got to spend a little time with the wife, spend a little time with the family, you know, and make yep, sure yep. that I'm not burning myself out. I have a little quiet time. And, it, you know, it's I think there's phases and maybe seasons that I think we all, if we're serious about anything, we're going to have to sacrifice. You know, my first five years of my business, I mean, I literally was working 120 hours a week and just went right through with one you. business after <laughs> another. Yeah. But, and then people are like, Oh, you're kind of thinking you're like an overnight success. And you're like, you don't understand the hours that I grinded and sacrificed. And yeah, I have a large facility now, but I went through five other businesses growing each one, you know, from the court in my yard, you know, my beach court at the house to training people out of my garage with sports performance to, you know, a small little studio that I rented in a 2000 square foot studio, then at any time fitness. And then finally got into a big facility that I was just renting beach courts until I was able to buy my facility. That's and awesome. so, you know, it's just kind of a progression, but it does, it takes, you know, if I'd say for probably the first five years to seven years, I mean, I had to be obsessed. But at the same time, 
you know, it did take a toll, you know, on my relationship with my wife and even spending time with family and friends and stuff. But I think if you have good family and friends and they understand your vision and your mission and, you know, it's something that they believe in and it's something that's positive, I think most are supportive. But there is times where I got to check myself and, you know, the work's still going to be there, you know. Yeah. So now, now <laughs> I'm down to about work. Eight, <laughs> yeah, I'm down to about 80 hours a week. I'm getting better. Uh, there you I just go. hired three more people, so I'm hoping to get it down to maybe 60, 65 hours here soon. Nice. I want to get to that. I want to <laughs> get to that a lot. Remind me to ask you about later about uh, financing for a facility because I'm sure a lot of people want to know about that. But I want to go back to when you're in practice, and I used to ask this to a bunch of the AVP guys. When you're in practice, should you put more focus on learning how to be a winner at all costs or fix what's broken. You know, there's some people that come from the school of thought, like at the pro level, at least where, hey, whatever we have in our arsenal, we have to figure out that winning is the most important. So figuring out how to win becomes really important. You know, mm -hmm. understanding that the flow of the game, what changes did they make? What changes do I have to make right now? How do I counter mm -hmm. that? That in itself, I think is a skill, but then also, you have to have some focus on, you know what, if my best swing is hard cross and I know that, and that's the only way that I could win this match in practice. So I know that that's how I, I should try to win, but I also have to develop a hard line. Mm -hmm. What should we do in practice? You know, and is it different at the, at the juniors college and pro level? Cause you've played at all of them and you've coached at, at all those levels. Yeah. Well, and back to kind of what I said, just to, to finish that is, as I say, development is the main focus until college and the pros. And that's when you're actually being paid to win. So college and the pros is a little different from juniors because in juniors, whether it's beach or indoor, the families, the, the parents are paying for their kid to get better. They're paying for their kid to be developed. So that's where I really put the emphasis more on the development. While yes, we're still trying to develop the mindset of a champion and you know what it takes to win, but it's mainly teaching them the tools and the you know really developing them to be able to be successful and have the skill sets it takes to be successful. But then I think it's kind of a slow transition as you get to high school and then the college that it then shifts more towards you know, now you're, the focus is winning. Now you're being paid mm -hmm. with a scholarship to win, you know, and then the pros you're being paid with a contract to win. So now the most important is winning. And really by that point, you've developed, you know, for the most part, a lot of the foundation and the fundamentals where now it's, it's a little more fine tuning where I say the focus is a lot more winning. What do I need to do with winning and really self-assessing? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? You know, how can I really play to my strengths, try to hide my weaknesses uh, to, to try to win this match? But at the same time, as you know, like my game on the beach side, you know, came a lot from the indoor. So I was just a lot of swinging and a lot of just bouncing balls. And I knew. Jumping and thumping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it took me to a decent level, you know, where I was, you know, able to play overseas indoor and I was able to qualify MVP. But at the same point, though, only having that, you know, limited my ceiling. And so when I would train, you know, a lot of times I knew I could bounce and I could beat all the guys that I'm training against swinging and bouncing the ball. But I knew to beat the top guys and really make an impact on tour, you know, I'm going to have to develop my finesse, my shots and my vision and everything else. So I would, you know, really try to focus on that in training and try to develop those weaknesses. But at the same time, when I got into the match, I'm trying to make money, you know, I'm trying to qualify <laughs> yeah. or I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to win the tournament. So, you know, yes, if I'm up, you know, I'm going to work on some of my shots, you know, I'm going to try to work on my finesse, but it comes down to crunch time. I got to go to the bread and butter, you know, I'm yeah. swinging, I'm swinging high and hard. And, you know, it, so I think it, it's maybe, I don't know if that was a more complicated answer, but I think it maybe depends on where you are in your career. I think mm -hmm. it maybe starts out a lot more focused on just the development, working through weaknesses and the fun fundamentals, a little less on just winning, but you're teaching the winning mindset, work ethic, you know, uh, yeah. mental toughness, how to be able to face adversity and bounce back and overcome type of things. But then as you start to grow and develop, I think the transition then 
comes to, hey, you know the fundamentals now. Yes, you need more reps to be a little more consistent, but that'll come in time. Now we're going to start to really focus on how can I win now and strategically use the gifts and talents I have, the strengths and weaknesses to win now. And I think that's when it really shifts probably after juniors or towards, you know, 16s to 18s in juniors gets pretty competitive and now you're trying to win and you're trying to get recruited and stuff like that. So it slowly, I think, transitions around, you know, 16 to 18 is where it's a lot more winning and you figure out how to win at all costs. In college well, let's say, pros. let's say that I'm, uh, you know, one of your former juniors players, right. Mm-hmm. And I'm now I'm, I'm in college and I'm a freshman or a sophomore. And I know that there's like this skill set that I need to develop, but I also know that in practice, my coach is running, a cauldron system where it's it's based only on who wins in practice and that's who starts and who gets their opportunity so how do i become a more well-rounded player when at at training winning is only what matters and i think because oh i gotta tie it back into most of our listeners who are adult players right they want everybody in their community to see that they're beating certain players so that they're gonna get picked up right by a higher level. Remember the first few years coming out to California training on the AVP and you're like, yeah, you know, I, I took a set from Theo in practice and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and meanwhile, like he just lifted 300 pounds the day before and like they've got their own training protocol and they're working on something completely new. So it doesn't, it matters nothing who you beat in practice, but you think it does. So what do you give to that person in college or that person who's on that adult court that is saying like, I know people are watching, I know they're paying attention to wins, but I also mm-hmm. know that I need to develop this skill. You know, how do they balance that? Yeah. I mean, for me, sometimes, you know, you just got to kind of split apart and make sure you're doing something extra. If it's a college kid, you know, I tell them, you know, when you're at practice, you know, you're trying to win the drill. You're trying to do whatever your coach needs you to do. And if that's how they're judging who gets play time, mm. then really in practice, you got to play to your strengths. You got to play to win. You know, you got to do what it takes. But then what I would say is then make sure either before practice or after practice, you know, you're sticking around, you're getting extra reps, you're going above and beyond putting in extra time to be able to work on that and develop it. As you know, it's like sometimes when you're working with somebody who comes to you with bad form on hitting mechanics or something. Well, if they're in middle of season, you know, it's really tough to say, hey, you know, next time you go to hit, you know, you need to really work on getting lower and loaded on your jump. And you're mm-hmm. like, you can't think about that when you're trying to think about right. where's the set going, how fast. Like it's you always give that caveat. The caveat's always like, listen, if you needed to win a championship tomorrow, don't do this. But if your championship's in six months from now, we got some time to work on it, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. And as you know, sometimes, you know, I, I do some stuff with like uh, the Vertimax. I like the Vertimax because it, it gives you, you some tell resistance. What, what a Vertimax is? So, yeah, Vertimax is just basically a jump platform with resistance bands that you can get resistance for the upward arm swing. So you either have hand straps, you're holding on to handles. So you have bungees going down. So you're getting resistance for the upward arm swing, but you also have a belt on with resistance bands going down from the weight belt on your hips down to the platform. So, so it's you're rubber getting bands just trying to pull you down, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's an eight foot platform with a really complicated pulley system underneath the platform that's like 60 feet of bungee. So it's not like the old Russian jumper, you know, where it's just like a little short little bungee. This is like a 60 foot bungee through pulleys. So it's even resistance throughout and everything. So it's, I like it because the kids, we can have them really focus on their jump mechanics. And so they're getting some resistance training, but it's a lot of repetitive, just perfect jump mechanics over and over again. And to me, that's where a lot of times I can work on a kid's jump mechanics when you break it apart and they're just working on that jumping. And then I tell them, you know, when you're in the middle of a game, we're in the middle of the season, you know, don't try to think too much about your jump mechanics, you know, continue to do these reps, you know, outside of practice. And slowly you'll see, you know, as you're doing hundreds and hundreds of these perfect reps, you'll start to see, start to come out more and more when you're playing naturally without you having to think a lot about it. Now, if you're in practice and it's slow and controlled and you're just doing hitting lines and warm ups, then you can think about your jump mechanics, your arm swing, all of that stuff. But as you know, like when you're in a big game and it's a pressure moment at 2020, 
you're not thinking, hey, let me get a little lower and try to drive through my hips a little more to try mm-hmm. to jump. You know, you got to think, crap, what's the wind doing? What's been working? You know, like you got so many other things going on. You know, that's not really the time to think about the development side. Now, if it's an easy game, you know, it's pool play or early on you're playing a low seated person. I'm all for like using some of those games to really work through some stuff, you know, that we've, we've done that in in some open tournaments. You get that, you know, that, that first team and you're like, this is going to be a win, but instead of us sleeping through it, instead of you relaxing through it, which I made that mistake in a lot of early tournaments, I was like, we're going to wipe (laughs) the floor with them. And then you have to expend so much more energy just because like you let them in the game. And then you spend 45 minutes developing bad habits. So mm-hmm. now I've changed that. Like if I know that we're going to wipe somebody, but if you're going to beat them, you know, I beat one team with only cut shots. I was like, Hey yeah. Logan, we're going to hit nothing but our best cut shots. We're going to get 42 reps of yeah. cut shots right now. And then you turn that into a little bit of practice. I like you're yeah. shaping that. Like if it's easy, if you have the opportunity to, then you, you try to make that change. And when you get into the emergency situation or you need that point, then just, you know, let it ride be in that moment. <laughs> yeah, if it's easy, you know, you that's where you can kind of work on some stuff. I'm right with you. I talk to my athletes a lot is too many times, you know, if you come into a match overconfident, uh, we got this, this is an easy game, you know, you start off too slow, you know, you give the other team some momentum and sometimes it's you almost give them too much momentum and it's almost impossible to catch back up and try to get into a rhythm or warm up. So I learned that as well. And so I try to teach that to my athletes that, hey, don't one, don't underestimate anybody. But for two, if this is going to be an easier match, then let's really work on some stuff that we've been struggling with or some new sets we've been working on, maybe faster tempo, you know, especially beach. Let's start working, running around behind and, you know, let's try to work on some stuff that we haven't maybe been that consistent with. And yeah, for me, you know, if I had an easier match, I knew that once again, I could swing hard, but I need to develop my finesse game and my shots. And so there would be a lot of those matches, same thing. I'd just come in and, all right, I'm just going to shoot all shots this match and just really work on challenging myself to you know, hit sharper and sharper shots and really more and more deceitful shots. So, yeah, I'm with you. And then that, to me, especially with young athletes, now you continue to you know, get them focused on development. And now they're actually learning something from that match where a lot of times if it's just a blowout, you know, I'll coach it, hey, let's screw around, let's mix up, you know, positions, mix up what we're doing. And now you basically just wasted a match, you wasted reps and you got no better. Probably worse. Of, yeah, you probably got worse because yeah, you start screwing around, learning bad habits and just teaching yourself how to play lazy. So yeah, I'm with you, I try to challenge challenge ourselves in every match and if it's easy yeah work on some of those weaknesses that you've been struggling with uh, hey you, you mentioned for the higher level so i know you're a a performance machine <laughs> we'll say i imagine uh, from your history and i don't have the stats on it that you've got a few certifications in sports performance and training right mm-hmm. so in terms of jump mechanics, and that's like the number one topic for all of our audience, if we put how to jump higher on something, it gets double the clicks, even though it's like, dude, you need to pass first. I don't care how- <laughs> Doesn't matter you if you jump, jump higher, yeah. If you can't set or pass, you're useless to me. So like, I didn't right. stop caring about jumping higher when like you can't even see the defense on the other side. Anyway, what's the one cue or thing that you need to fix with jump mechanics the most? when players come to you? You know, I feel like a lot of our young athletes don't use their arms at all. So you see like the butterflies sometimes, you know, like instead of, you know, long arms and really driving, I would say arms is probably one I see probably the most. What's the right way to to do arms? If you could explain it for anybody listening. And remember, Uh, some some people might be in their car right now. So you (laughs) got to give a visual. I can show you. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I mean, I've seen different research. Some say as much as 13%. Some say as much as 20% of your vertical comes from that upward arm swing. So, you know, we always just talk about long, straight arms. You want to swing them all the way back and swing them all the way up to really generate all that momentum and lift so that all that momentum that you generate with that upward arm swing can help, you know, drive, obviously, as you incorporate the hips and drive through with the legs that, 
you know, if you finish up with that momentum, it's going to naturally carry you higher. So getting our kids to get low and loaded and really swing in long arms, you know, from obviously back behind your body somewhere, you know, based on your flexibility, maybe almost at a 90 degree angle to your shoulders to swing all the way up above your head and then into the bow pose or whatever you want to call it when you draw your hitting arm back. But I think getting kids to use their arms where a lot of kids just kind of run up to the ball and just jump and swing and don't use their arms at all, or they just use a modified, like a little butterfly. There was somebody years ago teaching that in our area. We're telling people to swing their arms like around like a butterfly. And that was kind of, they're a wizard. (laughs) (laughs) It's just like, well, short arms naturally. (laughs) I I was just like, that just doesn't even make sense in my mind or how you could even explain it. That would be better. But so the elbow bend, you see a lot like the, people hitching their elbows a little bit and it doesn't quite get that same velocity or force into the ground. Right. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Short arms, bent arms. I call my little T-Rex arms, you know, you see kids with. So yeah, getting them to have long extended arms and really swinging those long arms and generating all that momentum to help lift them up. That would be one thing. Some of it is just their hip hinge, that angle, trying to get them lower where you see a lot of kids are just really upright and not really you know, getting a good, you know, I don't know what you teach. We typically say about a 90 degree angle from your hips to your upper body of trying to get lower. Some go off the so ground. You measure like your knee, your thigh, and then up to your shoulders, there would be like a 90 degree Correct. bend. But then you have to prevent people from folding forward to get that instead of sitting, right? Like I think right. a lot of people when, you, when they see, or you tell them to throw their arms back, they naturally mm. drop their chest forward. Forward, like, yeah. Well, no, 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 no. Like we still want to sit and yeah. throw yourself back with your chest up. So you like yeah, that. We talk about proud back. chest. Oh, yeah, proud, and that's where we talk about chest. proud chest. So when your arms are back, you still have the proud chest. You're, you can still see the ball where, yeah, I'm with you. Some just, as soon as you see, as you say, bring your upper body lower, they just bend straight over. But it's getting them to where sit back into it a little bit more where they still are with that proud chest. And so you know, then that knee up. angle, does that knee angle, then does that become 90 degrees as soon as the hip angle becomes 90 degrees? Cause the body has to counter for it. Right. Right. So like probably knees are somewhere about 90 degrees and, and that hip angle dropping there is 90 degrees. I see a lot of hoppers as well. People who, who jump from high and you need the ability to right. jump from like that almost quarter squat. You, you have to right. be able to do that, but it's definitely right. not optimal because you're not even using your glutes at that right. point. You're just like, it's all calves and toes. You're right. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I mean, yeah, trying to, obviously without compromising your technique and everybody's a little different, you know, depending on you know, how tight their hips are, their, you know, their calves, Achilles, all that stuff. But, and honestly, I've been a little removed just because I partnered with a hospital. So I have a hospital that has a whole sports medicine division wow. that they have their whole strength staff now trains all of my athletes. So I, I really haven't done any sports performance in probably five or six years just because they lease 13,000 square feet from me. So they have a physical therapy clinic on the first floor. And then on the second floor, they have a full strength staff that's phenomenal. So they train all of my athletes. And so they basically, all of my athletes rotate from court up to the weight room and do performance as part of their program. So every practice, sports performance is just a part of their practice. They just, they finish in the weight room either the last half hour or we have a group that goes, basically we have an hour on court and then four teams go to the weight room for a half hour while four teams are still on court and then they flip. So yeah, so it's one-on-one. what, 30 minutes in the weight room and how much time practicing? Hour and a half. Hour and a half. So that's, yeah. wow. So you're taking that two hours and you're saying that some of the most important, it's important enough to make sure that they train and get the strength training using those two hours. I think most coaches, high school coaches, club coaches would say like, no way. Like we can't even get into rotations or, or talk about an on to offense in beach. And now right. you want to, you want to take these kids into the weight room. Right. How do you measure that? Like it, if I were that person, if I were sticky and I was like, no, I can't take them into the weight room or I don't have a weight room to strength my kids in. Right. Do you have an answer for that? Uh, well, you know, you don't always have to have a full weight room. Yeah, no, it's nice. But as you know, you can do a lot of stuff, body weight with resistance bands. I think 
you know, I think sports performance has progressed quite a bit over the years where it's, you know, we're not trying to lift a house anymore. We're not trying to deadlift 5,000 pounds and stuff. I mean, yes, there is a time and a place for heavier weights, as you know, but, you know, I think you can figure out based on what you have, whether it's little to nothing or it's a world-class sports facility to put a good program together. Uh, for us, you know, we've made it important, but I want to make sure like our sports performance program really focuses first and foremost on the stability and mobility first so that our athletes are actually moving well and, you know, in full range of motion and try to do injury prevention. So we're doing full functional movement screens with the athletes and making sure that there's not any weaknesses and balances. So we're really trying to be proactive with our training where, you know, you talked about it before, you know, it, I, I can make you jump higher, but yes, if you can't pass, if you can't do these other things, you're still not going to be successful, but it's also, if you don't have good jump mechanics, if you're, you know, letting balls get over your left shoulder. And so every time you're leaning and naturally your body, like you mentioned earlier, wants to balance out. So what do you do? You kick your leg out. Well, now you land on one leg every single time you land. Well, what good does it make? You know, if I make you jump higher, all I'm doing is putting you at higher and higher risk to blow out your ACL because now you're jumping higher. I never fix your hitting mechanics and some of these different things. So for us, I always want to make sure that, you know, we all of our athletes have a good solid foundation of not just skills, but, you know, of just basic movement patterns of, you know, each of their joints being able to have full range of motion. We don't have any weaknesses, deficiencies, imbalances, whatever. But then after they go through the stability and mobility is when we get into the strength and the power and they really progress them. So like the hospital does a good job of really using the latest research. You know, it's it, they really want to progress these kids in a safe, a safe way. And really they're focused on injury prevention. And so I think because we're doing it intelligently and we're able to explain to parents how, you know, we're going to help prolong your athlete's career, not just get them more vertical and hitting harder and these different things. You know, we're trying to make them uh, – a strong, you know, kind of bulletproof athlete who isn't constantly having aches and pains. And people don't injuries. realize that. Like um, I do little bits of real estate. And when you have a, a rental property, they say that the number one financial suck for a rental property is vacancy is when you don't have a paying renter in there. That's like the nightmare. And that's why you want to have good tenants who are staying and have a reason to stay in that neighborhood in that area so that they can be there for a long time because otherwise you're making zero, you know? And then when they move out, then you have to clean everything. You have to redo everything. So it looks nice for the next person. So then you're doubling, tripling your expenses along with zero income. And I think now like hearing you say it out loud, that's a hundred percent the exact same for athletes. The mm. biggest career suck is being out, being injured. Cause you yeah. can't work on anything. If you bust your ankle, you bust your knee, you know, of course, yes, you can get stronger. And one of the most important thing that people skip when they're hurt is go to film, like look right. at videos, learn from somewhere. People talk about our online courses, like, well, I'm hurt right now. So like, I don't think it's a good time for me to take the online course. I go, you have no other option to get better right now. Right. <laughs> like yeah, this how is do you the most growing? important time. Yeah. But having that injury prevention protocol and a strength increasing protocol, that will give you so many more years and so much higher potential as a player in your career, because mm -hmm. you're not going to lose two months to an injury. Right. Imagine losing two months. Oof, it's brutal. Yeah. Well, especially as a young athlete. I mean, you know now, I mean, just, you know, beach is growing, indoor volleyball is growing. I mean, volleyball is just really you know, growing in our country. And so there's more and more high level athletes. And, you know, you try to tell a young athlete, you know, yeah, it, you might be in the recruiting process, but you blow your knee out, you tear your shoulder. Like, I know a lot of athletes, college coaches just stop recruiting them. You know, not too many colleges are going to take a chance on an athlete, you know, who just blew her ACL or just tore her, you know, rotator cuff or something. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it could be the end of your actual career, you know, so yeah. it, let alone constantly having these setbacks that keep putting you further and further behind from a development situation. So, yeah, I mean, to me, that's, 
you know, the same way you train the skills, you got to train the physical body. And as we're starting to learn just throughout sports, you also got to train the mind. And so I think it's back to kind of what we've tried to do is, you know, empowering the mind, body and soul of champions. It's really trying to provide a holistic program, because as you've known, you know, if you want to be the best athlete, it's not good enough for you just to be the most skilled athlete. You also got to be one of the most physically strong and endurance athletes, but you also got to be one of the most intelligent volleyball players, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, you got to be rooted and grounded, you know, like mentally, you got to be, you know, your identity, you have you know confidence, have security that one or two blocks, is it going to shake you? And is it going to frazzle you and you freak out now? I just got blocked. Oh my God, what do I do? He's so big. And, you know, and you start just making just, uncommon errors. And so, yeah, I think it truly to be truly successful in life, but also in sport, you have to be well-rounded and you have to be, or at least pursuing excellence in every area. If you truly want to reach excellence, because as you know, there's a lot of great physical studs that have no skills, you know, or not good enough skills to win or got all the skills in the world. But the guy's lazy, never hits the weight room. You know, yeah, he's great first couple of matches, but then he's exhausted and he's cramping up and, you know, he's worthless, you know, yeah, yeah. towards the end of the tournament. Or just, you know, a little undersized. You just never, you know, developed a big enough vertical to really elevate and do, you know, much. And, you know, you're limited on your angles. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's, you know, I've, Obviously, maybe at different points in kids' careers, you know, obviously fundamentals are one of the most important, but so is learning some of the basic movement patterns and jumping and landing safely. Um, And throwing, like throwing and swinging. I had somebody comment on my, uh, like I I showed one highlight of cross-body swing and somebody commented on my Instagram today (laughs) and she was like, cross-body swing, that's what got me a surgery doing all those. I go, a cross-body swing did, did not get you a surgery Your improper like, cross body swing maybe <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly like you could do it thousands and thousands and thousands of times and i know coaches who have been doing it for you know 30 years and never have a problem if you have the yeah. right mobility the right things are activating and you have a good sequence there right. you know which little Shout out to our own program. I'll take a minute to market it, guys. If you want to fix your arm swing, we have a program for that. It's called Fix Your Arm Swing in 21 Days. I'll throw it up on the screen, but better at beach.com forward slash fix your volleyball arm swing. Better at beach.com forward slash fix your volleyball arm swing. We go through a strength protocol, we go through a throwing protocol to teach people because in the beginning, Brandon, when he started coaching adults, he was like, you know, like everybody here has thrown a football in their life and blah, blah. And I was like, <laughs> have they actually <laughs> maybe like, years ago they used to but yeah yeah like and there's tons of people you know i get, I get people that like volleyball might have been their first ever ball sport and yeah. it might have been when they're 30 so they don't have any of those things that you know when you're a kid and you, and you have a coach looking at you constantly that's the advantage of a kid is that it's almost difficult now which is kind of negative kind of positive but you have somebody looking at you volunteering to correct you for the first however many years of your life. And that's why these kids can be at 16 better than a 30 year old, like by far, because they had the first eight years of their sport, somebody looking at them correcting when a 30 year old starts and they go to 38 and they don't hire a coach, they don't have somebody watching. Sure. They've been playing the same amount of time, but they have gotten literally infinitely less feedback. So they can't even learn it. And they're just trying to like, you know, you get one tip from the local open player and you're like okay i can do that yeah. right yeah they're just kind of figuring it out as they go and taking good and bad advice from every player on the beach and bad advice yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, this guy told me to do it that way well good if you want to play like that guy then listen to that guy but if you actually want to win and do it correctly do it like the rest of these guys that are actually playing professionally what's the worst beach volleyball advice you ever got or something that like you thought was good but then you realized years later, it was like, oh, damn it. I can't believe I listened to that. <laughs> oh, geez. The worst advice. I don't know that I've, oh, man. I'm going to have to think about that when I come back. Because honestly, I, I really, I have been blessed where, you know, 
my mother played, my older sister played, and then pretty wow. early on, I was able to get into a high level, you know, Muncieana on the indoor side is one of the top indoor clubs, you know, they're an hour and a half from us. And so I was able to go down there and play and be taught by some really high level people. And then, you know, being at IPFW with coach ball, you know, being a hall of fame coach and it's yeah. I, I feel like we had a lot of good coaches, you know, but you got, you got into beach late, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I grew up actually playing a lot of beach, but never okay. really getting a lot of good beach instruction. So, I mean, I think I played my first tournament at like 11. We used to go into Michigan and up Dang. to Chicago. It was only three hours away. So every summer, you know, I play on Saturday with my older sister's boyfriend and the men's. And then I play with my mom and co-ed on Sunday because back then they didn't have a bunch of juniors tournaments. So you just had to play low level co-ed tournaments and, you know, men's tournaments. But yeah, I would say maybe with beach, there is just, you know, I didn't get a lot of fundamental beach mm -hmm. training when I was young. So little stuff that I just didn't know, um, you know, I still remember playing Adrian and Steve Grotowski back in the day when they were a, a team. And, you know, I never knew to serve and come in if I'm the server, come in the middle back, you know, kind of in that, you know, USA calls it that point of intersection. Mm -hmm. So I'm just serving from like the left sideline and I'm just bombing my jump serve and Adrian, I'm just walking in on the left sideline coming in and Adrian's just going up, looking at me, shooting the ball over into the other, you know, over into zone one. And then I'm like, I'm going to bomb my serve and I'm going to run in and I'm running in. And he's shooting the ball the other corner. Like, <laughs> this little stuff like, but I didn't realize until I started having some of the older guys and teaching me kind of some of the systems and stuff that, all right, let me serve and then come in and kind of balance the court, you know, and be yeah. kind of in the middle and then wait to shift or anything. And so, and I think I can't pinpoint one bad thing, but there was just a lot of stuff that I just kind of learned just playing that I didn't realize until I actually got good coaching that I was doing it wrong, um, that there was a better, more efficient way. But it's yeah, always how it goes, you know? know, you get that third eye and you're just like, oh, at the camps and clinics, I go, you guys are here paying money so that we can find things that are not going well. I go, you didn't come and pay, you know, 200 bucks for a clinic so that we could tell you how good you are. Right. <laughs> like, right. If, you, if you want that, you can hire somebody to like tell you you're handsome for two hours, you know, right. <laughs> <laughs> but you're here and you're hoping any player should be begging and hoping for a coach that is like trying to point out their little flaws that might make them better. You know, not somebody who's going to criticize and, and attack you as a coach. That's, that's terrible. But somebody right. who's going to find and hunt down the things that you don't see. And then even when high level players do it, most, we have this like confirmation bias, right? Where you look at yourself playing film in order and your mindset is trying to prove yourself right. You know, you lose a tournament and you're like, let me watch film and see how many times my partner made an error. Right, right. And it's like, see, he's doing that wrong, you know, be but that's only from your thoughts. And that's why a, a coach, somebody else, and really, if you don't have that other coach, like having a, a great partner relationship and open communication where you can be honest mm -hmm. about what they're doing and what they're not and not fear that they're going to drop you or hate you. Um, right. But that having somebody else look at your game and say, this is what you're doing that you don't know is wrong. Yeah. Right. And that's the scariest stuff when we don't know something's wrong and we keep on delivering on the improper way or, or something that's going to like hurt our game, whether it's in the weight room, whether it's mentally or on the court. No, 100%. I mean, I truly believe everybody, you know, needs to have a coach um, just having a second set of eyes because, yeah, you're 100 percent right. We obviously have our habits. We have, you know, the movement patterns that we've trained and developed over the years. And, you know, yeah, we can watch film and yeah, hopefully we catch a lot of stuff and hopefully you're honest with yourselves, but there's just some stuff that you just don't catch like a coach on the sideline, you know, really analyzing and watching. And mm -hmm. yeah, I think having, you know, whether it's an actual official coach or just having, you know, players that, or you're playing with or against that are honest and that you trust enough and have enough of a relationship that you can have those open conversations. Like, did you see me move early? Like, man, you're carving me up. Like, yep. what am I doing? Like, yeah, I see you. You're taking off early every single time, you know, like, 
so, you know, just getting honest feedback and maybe talking to, you know, your friends and training and, or at least hopefully you have people that you're training with that you trust and you can have that open conversation. I know sometimes the training partners is, Hey, I'm trying to beat you. I'm seeing you this weekend. I'm not going to help you beat me and get any better. Jake uh, Gibb did that to me when I was training against him. And he was like, I had so much respect for him. I was like, you know, I, he got blocked. I was like, did you see me going for that? And he was like, I'll tell you when I'm retired. Like, and <laughs> that, <That's awesome>. like <laughs> that. Was, and I was like, he was the first one that like, wouldn't have that discussion. He's like, right. you, you're going to try to beat me next weekend. Yeah, <laughs> like, why yeah, I yeah. I'm not going to give you all the secrets. <laughs> yeah. like that. You can respect that though. Hell yeah. yeah. Cool. Hey, well, we got one. We got to wrap this up, but I, I want to know, well, first of all, I want you to just brag <laughs> uh, about it, about empowered sports and, and what it does and, and why you built it. And then after that, just tell us how we can reach you, how we can find you or how other clubs can come and learn from you, learn how to build a facility, which I might have you on my other podcast to talk about facility building and, and getting that stuff done. But tell yeah. us about empowered sports, empowered volleyball and how people can, can reach out to you. Yeah. Um, you know, it just was, had a playing career, you know, and before that, you know, I was pretty wild when I was young, got in a little bit of trouble. And so part of what I do now is mentoring kids too. And so I, I use sports as also an avenue to be able to kind of teach life skills to help kids be more successful and not, you know, make the same mistakes I did. And, you know, I, I got into the, the drinking and the drugs and the partying in college and got into a lot of trouble and lost my volleyball career for a while. And so a lot of what we do at Empowered is I want to be a one stop shop and I want to be able to provide anything and everything that a young athlete would need to be successful and fulfill whatever their dream is, whether it's just make the high school team, whether it's to go play in college or whether it's to go play professionally. You know, we've really, you know, we bought the place. It was 68,000 square feet. It was actually a tennis club. And then I've since added another 21,000 uh, square feet with indoor beach facilities. So I've got five indoor beach courts uh, with a full bar and mezzanine. And then is that where you teach the kids not to drink? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, you got to have that conversation too. If you don't have that conversation, they're going to learn it from somebody. Uh, so yeah, no, we, we discussed moderation and yeah, knowing when. Uh, so yeah, no, we really, I mean, on the indoor side, you know, we've got four hard courts. I've got a big mezzanine that overlooks the hard courts. And then on the other side, I actually have a turf field. So I've got football, soccer, baseball, batting cages on one side. And then hard courts on the other, and then you go through a hallway and a door and you go into our beach facility. And so up in the mezzanine that overlooks the hard course and the turf, I have another bar up there and then a full, it's kind of a sports bar. So I've got TVs, couches, fireplace, foosball, that air hockey. like heaven. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's huh. really everything that we wanted as young athletes growing up, I've really tried to build, you know, mm. I want it to be kind of a community center. Like we grew up going to the YMCA playing pickup basketball every day, you know, mm -hmm. doing whatever we could playing in the little rec center. So I wanted it to be, you know, a place that kids could hang out, you know, be kind of a community center, but also be, you know, a high level training facility where I've partnered with the hospital. They have their full strength staff. They got their nutritionist that meets with my athletes once a month. You know, they're physical therapists that are there. They also have an athletic trainer. They basically treat us like a college. So we have an athletic trainer at our practices. So if somebody gets hurt, I don't even deal with issues anymore. You know, the old school, like, hey, can you still bend it? It's not broke. Get back out there. Like <laughs> now, like, I don't even care if it's a hang now. If a kid comes to me, like, my finger hurts, but like, go see the trainer. I don't, I don't want a lawsuit. I don't want any issues. If it hurts, go talk to the professional. And so it's, you know, we really have tried to think through anything and everything an athlete would need to reach their full potential. Yeah. Um, but also be able to provide kind of a safe environment, a safe home that families know, like I can drop my kid off and she can be here for the next two to three hours or during the summer, you know, we'll have a, a beach program followed up by an indoor program afterwards. So parents will drop their kids off for three, four hours, you know, where they'll go from the beach training and then come inside. You know, I've got a smoothie bar in there too, so they can get a healthy little smoothie and then, you know, go and do the indoor program. And really, we also, all of our club kids, beach or indoor, also get a membership to the facility. Um, oh, because wow. I, I want my kids to be gym rats, you know. And unfortunately, in volleyball, 
you know, unless your parents, you know, are, are coaches, you don't have typically access to a nice indoor gym. And yeah. then most of the beach courts, unfortunately, in the Midwest, the beach are courts- Are never near a weight room. Oh, so you got yeah, two well, separate trips, right? Like you got to go well, to the beach and then you spend an hour driving, you got to go to the gym and it's like your whole day is gone. Exactly. And if you have anything local, it's typically terrible sand, terrible net systems. You know, it's recreational courts built for beer leagues or something like that. It's not courts you want to train on, good deep sand to train in. So, yeah, it's, you know, I wanted to be able to provide that with our facility where anytime it's open, the courts are open, our kids have a membership, they can come in, they can get reps, they can use our serving machine, they can use our AccuSpike, Vertimaxes, whatever equipment. They can come and just get reps, you know, so it's nothing makes me happier than coming in on like an off day. Say it's a Saturday. We don't have anything going on. And I see this little girl out there with her parents, you know, her parents are serving her balls or tossing for her while she's hitting or her little brothers out there, you know, yeah. peppering with her or something like I, I just want to provide an atmosphere in a, in a facility that. You know, kids can just get reps whenever they want. You know, their families can come in with them, but also they, they know. They got a place yeah. they can go, right? Like, yeah. I had a pretty solid family, and I know that I had a bunch of friends that didn't. And my family always just let people in. It was mm -hmm. an open door. And when you got a facility in a community like yours where somebody just like, I have nowhere to go, but at least I can go here. Yeah. You know, that's a yeah. big deal. Yeah, no, we're actually even taking a step further. We just hired four new directors. And one of them is going to be our director of mental health. She's a, a college coach and also got a you know, bachelor's, master's and everything in, in psychology. And is phenomenal just with our young athletes. She's coached for us. She's done some of our character building. But, yeah, we're, we're looking going even further into the mental development side. And especially a lot of these young athletes, as you know, you know, they're they're facing more and more younger and younger ages and so we're getting these young athletes that are just mentally broken and fragile and they're stud athletes physically but mentally they're just so insecure they lack so much confidence and you know we really got to learn how to build them up and unfortunately some are a little spoiled and entitled and don't know how to work hard and those things so then we got to teach them to learn how to you know teach them how to push themselves until yep. they learn how to push themselves. Discomfort. Um, it's a real thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, no, we're, we're looking at even, you know, I, I feel like that's going to be the next big frontier in youth sports is the mental side and talking to some different college coaches. One buddy the other day was like, I, I foresee one day there'll be there being a sports psychologist for every single team. Where right now at their university, there's one sports psychologist for all the all the teams. Right. Um, awesome. So yeah, I, we're just always trying to figure out what program could we implement, what type of person, professional could we bring in to either speak to our kids or to be able to provide another level of training uh, that would help elevate our athletes' games, and just try to figure out how we can just reach, you know, help our athletes reach their full potential. Like I said earlier, in every area of their life. And to me, if you're chasing excellence in every area and you're reaching your full potential in every area, you're going to reach your full potential in sports and life and relationships and one day in your career or whatever it is. Uh, so yeah, we're just trying to really lay the ground, you know, rules and kind of the foundation, I guess, for success. Uh, and we're just using volleyball as our main sport. And that's, I own all of that program, the indoor and the beach, but like the baseball, rugby, soccer, all that stuff. I, I rent out space to uh, a few other organizations that are like minded. And then the hospital with their sports medicine. They do a lot of arm care for pitchers. And so to for everybody who's them. who's trying to get a better look at that, uh, what website can we all go to and uh, see the heaven that you've built there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So empoweredsportsclub.com is the facility and then empoweredvolleyball.com that is my volleyball website but you can go to empoweredsportsclub.com you can see the whole facility you can also get to our club page so yeah we've had our we've had our beach club now 11 years 10 11 years and then we just finished our eighth year with our our beach club and so yeah we've you know, the facility, we bought it, took it over in December of 13, but officially finished the sale and everything. What was it? June of 2014. So about eight years, a little over eight years 
you know, we've really, you know, we've got now 37 teams. Wow. I've got a second site, another satellite. So I've got 29 in-house teams and eight at a satellite for indoor. And then beach, all of my indoor kids all do beach one day a week as a part of the, their program. Because I truly believe to be the best indoor player, you you still need to use the beach and, you know, everything that you can learn and glean from the beach game to really elevate your indoor game. And I think vice versa, too. I think sometimes beach players just focus on beach. But if you have a little bit of that power and explosiveness from the indoor side and, and a no lot of the fear of block, right? Just yeah, like, yeah. you know what? I don't care how many people are in front of me. I'm going to rip. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and so if you can combine some of the best of both surfaces, I truly believe that, you know, it'll make you the best at either one of them. And I mean, I think that's why, you know, the Kerry Walsh's, the Karts Karai's, you know, a lot of those big names, you know, they were successful at both. And I think ultimately that's what made them arguably some of the best players to ever play the game because they were really good at both. And I think used both surfaces you know, throughout their career for training and whatnot. Uh, so, yeah, we've, you know, Power Sports Club is the facility, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Yeah, we're up to 90,000 square feet. We've got another satellite in Warsaw, Indiana, about an hour away. I'm just finalized and I got a, a big management deal I'm working on, bringing in a couple of new big partners, another big facility. I've got a couple more lined up down the road. So really, you know, we're, we're, even branching out outside of our facility and outside of even just volleyball and looking at, you know, with other facilities in our management group, you know, really trying to take what we build at Empowered and that kind of that one-stop shop and holistic model. And, you know, these organizations are wanting me to go and kind of take that model, you know, into basketball, into baseball, into football, into soccer, um, where they can add in, you know, we've got full recruiting, a whole platform that we use uh -huh. on top of, you know, the mental side on top of, you know, we do character building, leadership, development, just trying to really make these kids not just the best at their sport, but also, you know, the best and most successful in life for the next 50 years. Or, you know, as you know, you know, if you're trying to be a professional in volleyball, you better be pretty intelligent at business and be <laughs> good at marketing and be a good entrepreneur if you yeah. really want to actually make some money and be able to provide for a family <laughs> so, yep. with you there. So, yeah. So yeah, we really just try to think of everything that, you know, a young athlete would need to be successful on and off the court. And, you know, we've just been blessed with some huge partnerships and some, you know, some great community support from businesses and some influential people. Um, and then obviously our, our IPFW family, most of us all played at Indiana, Purdue, Fort Wayne, which yeah. is now Fort, Purdue, Fort Wayne, but a lot of high level alumni that have played professionally and on the national team um, that really help, you know, support and grow our program and provide some high level training. And as you know, you can only do so much yourself. you got to surround yourself. As I've seen, you know, you're building out more and more coaches on better at beach and on your team. That's where you can really grow and make a bigger impact and really yep. grow your sphere of influence. So, yeah, man, I, I appreciate everything. I know you, you hype me up, but, it, you know, the, f the feeling is mutual, man. I love everything that I see you guys doing, you and Brandon. You know, I love you guys to death, and I just – I get excited every time I see a new video come out and I see you guys unveiling some new, new programs, and I love all of it, you know. And, you know, you, you got ahead of me on, on the videos and stuff. I know I got ahead of you on the facility side. Yeah. But I love how we can always talk and, and share information. You know, I, I'm working on some of the stuff we're doing video right now. It's just all in-house and for our own training um, so with great. our training platform. But eventually, you know, as long I'd as like you record it somewhere, you can use it yeah. later. I think people yeah. like coaches, trainers, personal trainers, people who build businesses like just write every single thing you do down. You have no idea how valuable it will be to just open a file and be like, oh, I already built that. Yeah. Like all you got to do is now hand it to somebody and then they'll just clean it up and make it look pretty. Like, oh, yeah, so nice. And that's the key to business. I mean, building yeah. systems and processes that, you know, every year now my whole schedule is pretty much on a cycle. You know, every year we're just shifting tournaments. Oh, this date, you know, it moved two days now. Here's the new tournament yeah. for this year. And yeah, the programming is, hey, here's last year's flyer. Let me change the dates. Are we making any tweaks? 
all right, this program's out. And so it just so much more efficient and yeah. uh, it just makes your job a lot easier if you already Don't got throw it all. anything out. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep everything. Put it all in one work. giant Google file. Yeah. And then yeah, I still got workout out. files, you know, my workout logs from 20 years ago, you know, like mm -hmm. 15 years ago. Uh, I, I, I keep everything. So now nah, that's that's some wise words right there. Cool. Yeah, record it all, track it all. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, man, thank you for staying up late. I know uh, I've got, got dinner waiting here, so I'm going I'm to get to mine, but I I appreciate you. And like I said, thanks for meeting. Thanks for taking your time. I know how busy you are and how much it means to to take even an hour, no less two hours now of your time. So I really appreciate that. And for everything that you're doing for kids and doing it the right way and, and doing it from the lessons that you learned and to be able to make the world a better place by injecting goodness into your entire community like just from the world if it's not thanking you enough thank you Thanks, nice bro. job man i appreciate it man i'm trying and yeah i appreciate everything you guys are doing and yeah anytime you need something man i'm always here for you guys and like i always said you guys i feel like are cut from the same cloth you know mm -hmm. you guys truly care about the sport you're trying to put good information out there you're trying to educate people in our community and I feel like you're doing it the right way. So yeah, keep it up, man. And keep putting out good info and good content and yeah, keep, keep sharing like you're doing, man. I'm super yeah. proud of you guys. Tell everybody out on the West coast. I said, what's up. And uh, well, yeah, I'll be out there at the end. I gotta go chew the Vista uh, for some of the national team development stuff the end of nice. July. So if anybody's around, uh, yeah, you guys let me know. Hopefully we can catch up. Will do. We'll do, All and we'll right, be uh, close behind you, and I'll be hiring you for some coaching when we build our spot in uh, in Chattanooga. So, <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> take some. I'll take a lot of notes from you. Well, let me know if you need a management team to uh, run the facility, man. You can do all the yeah, training. There will be phone calls within the next few months. You can guarantee that. <laughs> yeah, no, anything I could do to help, man. If it's just some suggestions or ideas, I'm always here for you guys. Cool, cool. Thanks, Will. Hi, right, brother. Hey, have a great night. Good luck in your training. And then we'll see you later this summer. All right. Sounds good, brother. See you soon. Later. Thanks for having me.